Dr. Lindman-Woods. Thank you very much. I think Keith got all the neat pictures, so I'm going to have to struggle through here. So um, I think viral hepatitis is important for all of you to be aware of for two reasons. One is it's very common, so you'll interact with physicians and patients that are being treated for viral hepatitis. But more importantly, uh, especially those of you that are device reps, uh, you're at risk for contracting viral hepatitis, particularly if you're assisting with procedures. And sometimes it's very difficult to know that the patients are actually uh, infected uh, with a, a virus, a hepatitis virus. Uh, particularly when they present jaundice and we're doing ERCPs or other procedures. So all of you should be seeing your, I'm sure you have a corporate policy, you should be seen by your corporate physicians, you should have hepatitis B uh, uh, injections, you should have the, uh, the vaccine because you can protect yourself from ever getting hepatitis B. You can also protect yourself from getting hepatitis A, which is not really relevant to medical work, but it is important if you're traveling. And uh, you should be aware of if you have a needle stick, if you get stuck with a device that breaks your skin, during a procedure, you should not ignore that. You should not just put a Band-Aid on it and say, oh, it's going to be okay, because if that device had contacted the patient or had blood or uh, a small amount of virus in it, you can contract the virus, and then you won't find out about it till later, and it'll be very difficult to bring it back to that, that event. Okay, so you're better protected to report it and to figure it out. There, the, the most commonly caused viruses now, A, B, C, D, and E, this is just because we're only in 2018 now, and by the time we're in 2030, there'll be E, F, G, H, and I, I'm sure, because this is the natural evolution of viruses. Uh, they cause acute and chronic hepatitis. There's a, a, a typical uh, presentation with viral hepatitis that is not uncommon. Patients initially are asymptomatic after they've been exposed. The viral load goes up, and after a period of time, they'll start to develop these, these symptoms that are really nonspecific. Fatigue, loss of appetite, just don't quite feel right. And then it's not until they get into the ecteric phase where they turn yellow that people say, oh my, maybe you have hepatitis. Uh, and that phase can be somewhat hidden in some patients as well. And then typically for uh, acute hepatitis uh, A and B, there will be resolution of that and the patients will do well. Uh, in some forms of virus, particularly C, uh, that, that convalescent phase occurs, but you don't really get resolution of the virus. It stays active in your system until you treat it. So hepatitis A and E are uh, essentially the, we call these the food truck viruses. You typically uh, encounter them uh, in the fecal oral routes. Uh, they're very common in, in uh, under, uh, underdeveloped countries, uh, and they can cause acute hepatitis. And believe it or not, uh, people this, di this day still die from acute hepatitis A in the United States. So it can cause a very virulent immune response in people, and you can end up losing your liver. Uh, so there's really no way to protect yourself uh, if you're going to be uh, exposed to this when you're eating at restaurants. It could be something as common as Qdoba, or it could be someplace like, uh, uh, you know, uh, a foreign country. Uh, as I said, there is a, an immunization series for hepatitis A. If you're interested in that, I'm sure you can talk to your physician about getting that. Um, and as you get younger, you're much more likely to form an immune response with these, immune, with these uh, vaccines. So uh, consider it. Uh, hepatitis B, there's really no reason why any of us should get hepatitis B anymore. There's a very effective immune immunization program for that. Uh, it was at one time in the United States a very common cause of liver failure and disease. Worldwide, it's still the, one of the most common forms of hepatitis. It's endemic in some parts of the world. Um, and uh, many patients will get an acute hepatitis and respond well and they'll look fine, but some patients develop a very chronic hepatitis with hepatitis B that can become problematic and can lead to uh, the most common problems uh, that we'll talk about that we're going to be facing in the United States down the road, which is the development of hepatocellular carcinoma in many of our patients that have cirrhosis. So hepatitis B can be transmitted vertically. So if you're pregnant and you're going to have a child, you could actually transmit that to your child. It's almost always transmitted by bloodborne transmission, either through blood transfusion, sexual activity, or uh, the use of uh, a common sharing of active uh, uh, blood in, let's say, a used needle or something like that. Uh, the goals of treatment are really to eliminate uh, or sustain, uh, suppress, suppress the hepatitis B replication. As long as the hepatitis B virus is suppressed, you're not going to have problems with it. However, if it's uh, active or if you develop uh, chronic uh, uh, inflammation, you'll develop cirrhosis, and the complications of cirrhosis will, will uh, eventually lead to liver failure. Uh, 
Um, and then uh, the, the, the big problem, which is looming on our horizon right now, are all these patients who've had cirrhosis for a number of years are starting to develop hepatocellular carcinomas. Uh, these tend to be uh, very uh, indolent. They tend to uh, occur uh, without many symptoms initially, and once you have it, it becomes a challenge to treat it. Um, there are very effective treatments for hepatitis B. It's, quite honestly, most patients with hepatitis B we don't treat. They go through the acute phase, they get better, they eliminate the virus. But for those that have persistent viremia or they have antibody responses, uh, we tend to use interferon still because they don't develop drug resistance. The hepatitis B virus very rapidly becomes resistant to the, the nucleosides and nucleotides that we use for hepatitis C. So we use those as a last resort. And if you have anyone that has active hepatitis B or they have chronic disease, they really should be followed by a hepatologist because these guidelines are changing almost as fast as they're getting published nowadays in terms of how to treat these different diseases. Hepatitis C is really the hidden uh, epidemic in the United States. Uh, most of this uh, is largely due to the transmission through, through blood, and that's primarily through IV drug injection. Um, and it usually leads to a chronic hepatitis. Uh, there's a small amount of blood that is transfused that, that gets through without having the hepatitis C detected. There may be a small amount of uh, transmission with uh, bloodborne or sexual transmission, but really IV drug use uh, is the most common mode of transmission for this, this virus. Uh, and it uh, can be a uh, uh, simple, uh, long-term past history of even one or two episodes of using IV drugs. It just depends on who was using the needle before you were. Uh, this also develops a chronic hepatitis and uh, cirrhosis, uh, and it's often a more indolent form of hepatitis, so the patients present with cirrhosis without having any previous history. Uh, and it also is a, a, a risk factor for hepatocellular carcinoma, uh, which is now becoming one of the more common causes of liver cancer uh, in the hepatitis C populations. Um, it can be detected very easily by some blood work. Uh, even if you think you may have been exposed, if you think now maybe 20 years ago when I was in college, maybe I had a little experimentation with IV drugs, it would be worth your while to get your blood checked to make sure you don't have hepatitis C because if you stop the process now, we have very effective therapies now that can completely eliminate hepatitis C. And this is really one of the few success stories in medicine over the last decade, similar to the Barrett's esophagus uh, story. Hepatitis C should be able to be effectively treated in over 95% of people, no matter what genotype you have, no matter how long you've had it. So if you haven't been tested for hepatitis C, you should, uh, particularly if you have abnormal liver tests for some reason, uh, and you should make sure that you're being effectively managed for it. And there are a number of medications that are available. They're expensive, but the studies, the cost-effective studies have shown that treatment, even at the high prices for these medications, is cost-effective in terms of long-term management of patients. Now, what about cirrhosis in general? This can happen for a number of reasons, uh, not just hepatitis, but from, from alcohol abuse, from uh, what we would call uh, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, or some, some people term fatty liver disease. This is really more than just fatty liver. This is actually the, the form of uh, steatohepatitis where you get fibrosis in addition to fat in your liver. Hepatitis B, PBC, primary biliary cirrhosis, you may have heard of that condition, which is different from primary sclerosing cholangitis. Uh, autoimmune hepatitis and hereditary hemochromatosis are the most common causes of uh, cirrhosis in this country, and the top three are the most common that we see nowadays. So what happens when you end up with uh, cirrhosis and scarring of the liver? Remember I explained in the initial uh, lecture that I gave to you that the, the liver is a biochemical factory. It's essential for producing uh, and modifying uh, certain uh, hormones and, and structures, but it also is a filter. And if that filter becomes fibrotic and clogged, then there is a problem with flow from the portal venous system to the hepatic veins and, and to the bile ducts. So what you start to see is that the pressure builds up in the, in the portal system, and you end up with things like varices, you end up with very large hemorrhoids sometimes, you start to develop uh, a fluid pressure gradient in your uh, mesenteric veins, so you develop ascites, uh, 
and you'll get fluid in your abdomen. You may see some uh, very dilated veins on the surface of the skin called the caput. Um, you develop uh, an inability to process uh, toxins, so you become encephalopathic. You're not thinking clearly. You may see spider angiomatas. There's a, uh, a uh, angiogenesis factor that's, pr that's produced. It starts to develop these red spiders on the body. Males will develop gynecomastia that's prominent and noticed. You'll have problems with testicular atrophy because you're not able to process the, the estrogens and then you'll develop splenomegaly, jaundice, and eventually edema. So this is really end-stage cirrhosis, but there are very gradients of how this develops, and many people can have cirrhosis, and you wouldn't really even notice that they have any uh, illness initially until they start developing these factors. How do we diagnose it? It's almost always diagnosed initially by uh, either laboratory studies or imaging. Uh, we see a nodular surface of the liver. We can see the fibrosis that occurs on the surface of the liver. We'll see the liver gets become shrunken. We'll often also see some of the collateral changes. We'll see splenomegaly. You'll see that your varices or the blood vessels are very prominent around the liver because the blood can't go through the liver anymore. And then the ultimate diagnosis typically has been by liver biopsy, where you would obtain a specimen of the liver and look at it under histologic staining. That's changing dramatically now, and a lot of these diagnoses can be suspected or, or uh, confirmed using things like fiber scan and MRI scanning that are, that are becoming not as good as biopsy, but they're becoming close to liver biopsy and the ability to diagnose. The complications we see, uh, hepatic encephalopathy uh, is, is a common complication. It's a treatable complication. You may see patients uh, in your rounds or when you're working with physicians that are taking things like lactulose or antibiotics to reduce the amount of encephalopathy they have. Uh, this is typically manifest by confusion. Uh, unfortunately, it can be manifest by things like motor, uh, motor vehicle accidents or people falling or having accidents or not remembering where they are. Um, it can be, as I said, treated to some degree. Uh, ascites is fairly prominent and in, in visible in individuals. You'll see a fluid wave in their abdomen, and they clearly have a fair amount of fluid uh, that is com compressing their abdominal cavity. It can cause a lot of symptoms in terms of shortness of breath and uh, other issues that need to be managed and we can manage that by taking the fluid out or performing some of these shunts. Uh, varices we've already talked about, they can be a major issue in terms of bleeding. And then the long uh, end-term management or the end-term complication of hepatocellular carcinoma, as I said, can be quite devastating because once that develops, if it's not recognized, it can get to a size where it really cannot be treated. And as you can imagine, if the liver is barely functioning uh, in a person with cirrhosis, and then you have to look at a, a tumor that you want to resect or operate on, it's very difficult to do that and still have a functioning liver. So patients are sometimes candidates for transplant with hepatocellular carcinomas if they meet certain criteria. Often we treat these now with embolization therapies and radiofrequency ablation. These are more pictures of gastric uh, and esophageal varices. You can see the protuberant vessels. These vessels, you know, these, these dilated vessels occur in other parts of the body as well. The problem with the GI tract is that if they're in very close proximity to the lumen of the GI tract, then they can bleed into the GI tract, uh, and that creates an issue for us in terms of management. Uh, and there are several, several ways to deal with this. Uh, a lot of you may have been familiar with some of the, uh, the vascular work that's done in, current, in terms of tips and shunting uh, the portal vein and the hepatic vein, actually making those two come together so that the pressure drops. There's some great things that happen with that procedure, and it can be very effective. It also does reduce the blood flow to the liver, so some of the patients that we perform that procedure on get encephalopathic, and it can become an issue. Endoscopically, we can control the esophageal varices quite well. We have therapies for gastric varices as well, though typically we're not as effective at controlling gastric varices and gastric variceal bleeding as we are uh, esophageal varices. And this is just another reminder that when a hepatocellular carcinoma occurs, these patients will often get enrolled in therapy programs using interventional radiology to direct therapy to the cancer by embolizing it or placing radioactive beads in it or giving chemotherapy directly to it. Uh, and the reason we do that is that the patients really can't tolerate a resection of the liver because if you take out what's left of their right side of the liver, they will definitely go into liver failure and not be able to function. So the treatment in small lesions is liver replacement. That completely eliminates the cirrhosis, and it does cure the disease. But there are very specific criteria of who can be treated uh, with liver transplantation. Um, I want to. Some of you may have been exposed to patients with liver transplantation. We often see the patients that have complications of liver transplant, and those patients are often uh, very sick, very difficult to manage. 
Um, I just have to share with you, I had a patient uh, in the office uh, this week who was 28 years after a liver transplant, who was the first time she's actually been back in the hospital since her liver transplant, has done unbelievably well. So often as physicians, we don't get to see these success stories where the patients have done remarkably well. She's been maintained on immunosuppressants for all this period of time and has not had a complication. So it can be a totally life-altering and life-saving uh, therapy. I'm going to move now and talk a little bit about gallstone disease. Uh, gallstone disease is a rather simplistic condition. Uh, you know, it's a plumbing problem, essentially. You get a stone stuck some part in the biliary tree, causing obstruction. Uh, these stones are uh, actually fairly common, and in certain parts of the country, you'll see an awful lot of stone disease. Uh, some of that's related to genetics. Uh, some of it may be related to obesity, because we know that patients with obesity can develop gallstones earlier or easier than patients without. Uh, there are basically two types of gallstones, these black pigment stones um, and brown pigment stones. They occur from either uh, cell, red cell turnover, uh, hemolysis, or uh, infections in the biliary tree. Uh, there's a whole entity of uh, what we call oriental cholangiohepatitis. This is much more common outside the United States, where individuals get these pigment stones from biliary infections, probably thought to be due to some form of longstanding biliary infection with either parasites or bacteria that lead to recurrent formation of these brown pigment stones that are difficult to manage. Um, cholesterol stones are more common in the United States. They're truly the stones that we typically talk about when we think of people that are uh, obese and over 40 that have right upper quadrant pain. They're formed typically in the gallbladder, but they migrate out of the gallbladder and cause symptoms. Um, if you went to the mall out here in Oak Brook and started ultrasounding everybody, you'd probably find gallstones in about 20% of the people that came by your ultrasound machine. Almost none of those patients would have any symptoms of stone disease, and they would be able to function probably for the rest of their life in most cases without having anything to do with it. Uh, unfortunately, in patients that are passing stones or getting them stuck in the cystic duct or inflaming the gallbladder, they'll present with right upper quadrant pain. That's typically the first manifestation. It can be what we call a colicky pain in the sense that it accelerates, it's really intense, and then it goes away. And often patients will come to me and say, you know, I'm not sure what that was. It happened to me two weeks ago, then it happened to me last week. And sure enough, if you obtain an ultrasound, those patients have stones in the gallbladder. And typically, in our experience, that's an indication where you should send that patient for a surgical cholecystectomy. Because once you start having biliary colic, you're at risk for the other complications. In a sense, this is kind of a warning sign. It's often precipitated by food because when you eat, your gallbladder gets the hormonal signals to contract, and that's what spits the small stones out, or it's pushing bile out against an obstruction. So typically, we would see these, in, uh, these uh, on ultrasound. You'd actually see a, a, a filling defect in the gallbladder. This is a, a fluid-filled gallbladder in the right upper quadrant, and you see this shadow after it showing that it's a stone. And this is typically what it looks like on the, the caricatures of the drawings there. Um, the patients can get an acute cholecystitis. This is patients that present with a really severe, intense pain, sometimes with fever and uh, nausea, and that's because one of those small stones has gotten stuck in the pipe system here. If it's in the cystic duct, the, the area of inflammation is in the gallbladder. Their liver tests are usually normal. They present essentially with right upper quadrant pain. You do an ultrasound. They may have an elevated white count. They'll often be selected to go to surgery or decompression right away. If the stone, however, migrates further into the biliary tree, it can be create, create a, an additional problem called cholangitis, which I'll talk about in a second. This is just a, uh, an ultrasound of a gallbladder showing a little thickening of the gallbladder wall here, maybe a little pericholocystic fluid. Even though there's no stone seen here, those are all signs of acute cholecystitis. And that's really a surgical disease, and it's managed for the most part surgically. There's been talk about should we be doing more endoscopic management for this condition, but quite honestly, Almost anywhere in the country, you can have a laparoscopic cholecystectomy done relatively safely uh, with good result. And this is what typically happens at cholecystectomy. The, the uh, laparoscopes are placed into the laparoscope ports are placed in the right upper quadrant. You identify, the surgeon identifies the gallbladder fundus and then dissects down to the cystic duct. And then they'll put a couple clips across the cystic duct and the cystic artery and remove the diseased gallbladder. For most patients who don't have bile duct disease uh, or stones in the common bile duct, that resolves the problem completely forever. There are very few symptoms after cholecystectomy. Even though we've removed that reservoir of bile, some patients get a little more diarrhea, some patients get a little more constipation. Quite honestly, it kind of evens out, and there's really no post-cholecystectomy syndrome. 
uh, in the great majority of people. Some people clearly notice a big difference in their bowel habits after a cholecystectomy. They say they have much more diarrhea and it's difficult to manage, and we have ways to manage that with different medications to absorb the, the bile salts. Uh, Cholidocal lithiasis are basically stones seen in the, in the bile duct. They can be asymptomatic. They can cause mild elevations of liver tests. When they really cause a problem is when they develop colon, when a patient develops cholangitis, and that's when there's a partial obstruction of the biliary tree from the stone, and then they start to get the right side of the abdominal pain, jaundice, and fever. That, by definition, is a, a medical urgency. Uh, most of us now put patients on antibiotics, bring them in the hospital, give them IV fluids, and in a very short period of time would proceed to an endoscopic procedure to, to uh, remove the stone. We document that the stones are in the bile duct by ultrasound or other imaging modalities now. MRI is particularly useful for visualizing the biliary tree and can tell you what's going on. And then the ERCP procedure, much like uh, uh, Betsy uh, talked about earlier, uh, this is the typical view you see of the papilla from the side viewing endoscope. You're looking directly through the wall of the duodenum at the papilla, and then you're going to identify the opening where the bile duct and pancreatic duct is, and you're going to try to put a little catheter in the, in the bile duct, inject contrast to get your pictures, determine where the stone is, and then remove the stone. And the typical way we remove the stone is we make a small incision in the muscle of the wall of the bile duct, uh, up to the, the wall of the duodenum. Once we've created a bigger opening so that we can actually extract the stone, we'll actually pass a little balloon above the stone, blow the balloon up, and just bring that down. You can also use baskets and other devices to do this. And this has become very standard and a very uh, rewarding procedure. I'm going to shift gears a little bit and talk about pancreatitis. They are somewhat related, and in fact, probably one of the biggest risks of having a common bile duct stone is passing that stone through the sphincter of OD and causing pancreatitis. There, there are very few things, uh, in my experience, that can make people as sick uh, and as painful uh, as an episode of severe acute pancreatitis. Most of the pancreatitis we see is mild. Patients pass a small stone. We manipulate their papilla at ERCP. They get pain for a day or two, and they get better. But if, if they get a significant amount of edema there or if they get a, a, an acceleration of uh, pancreatitis where they start getting a cascade of inflammatory responses, we have seen people literally present with acute pancreatitis and within 12 hours be dead of pancreatitis because they get go into a a whole systemic response, almost essentially identical to septic shock. They go into a Sears syndrome, they can't breathe, they get fluid in their lungs, they go into renal failure, and it can be devastating. So we, uh, we really want to identify patients with pancreatitis quickly. We want to aggressively treat them with hydration, pain control, and then there are some therapies for acute pancreatitis in the setting. Um, it's often a very discreet episode of sudden onset pain. It's a very severe pain. Typically, the patients will be so uncomfortable they can't sit still. They'll go into a fetal position. The pain will go to their back. Uh, there are a number of things in the differential diagnosis that we exclude, but typically you can diagnose acute pancreatitis fairly quickly with some simple blood tests and some imaging. Everyone with acute pancreatitis has an elevated amylase and lipase level that can be obtained in most ERs within a few minutes. And then uh, CT scan imaging shows edema and an inflammation around the gland. We typically do that after we've hydrated the patients or protected their kidneys because we want to give them some dye uh, to be able to determine what the pancreas looks like. The, the mild cases of, of pancreatitis, they can get abdominal pain, they get nausea, vomiting, it's relatively self-limited and it'll resolve. It's these severe cases that we're concerned about where the patients really present with an acute abdomen, they can go on to confusion, coma, shock, uh, and it can be life-threatening. So the causes of pancreatitis, uh, gallstones and alcohol are the two most common causes of pancreatitis in, in, in this country, uh, and typically depending on where you are and what your patient's history is, it's one or the other. Uh, there's also a number of causes related to drugs, trauma, uh, there's an autoimmune pancreatitis that occurs, uh, hypertriglyceridemia can cause pancreatitis in some patients, that can be quite severe, and then there's manipulations of the ampulla like ERCP that can cause pancreatitis. So all of these things have to be considered in the differential. This is the typical uh, radiographic imaging you'd see in mild and severe pancreatitis. This is mild pancreatitis. The pancreas gland usually right here is a little edematous. You don't see the borders quite well. You're starting to see a little darkness in the fat around the pancreas. Here, this is severe necrotic pancreatitis. The pancreas has essentially been replaced by this fluid uh, collection. 
And when you think of this, pancreatitis, the, 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 the gland itself contains the enzymes that digest proteins and fats, right? So it's the same enzymes that'll take a piece of steak and turn it into essentially liquid. When you have severe pancreatitis and those enzymes are released in that area, you essentially auto-digest the structures around the pancreas. And that's why it can be so devastating. It can erode into blood vessels, it can cause walled off collections that get infected, uh, and it can be very severe. Fortunately, that doesn't happen as frequently as mild pancreatitis. The treatment for both types of pancreatitis is really supportive care. Uh, we give lots of fluids to hydrate the patients to prevent them from getting dehydrated because just like a burn injury with pancreatitis, you tend to get third spacing of the fluid in the abdominal cavity and they get intravascularly depleted. We also look at their electrolytes. We give them bowel rest, pain medications to kind of uh, relieve their pain uh, and uh, evaluate them quickly. There are specific treatments for pancreatitis. If this is gallstone pancreatitis and there's a stone stuck in the bile duct somewhere, particularly in the ampulla of water where it's causing back pressure that allows the, the pressure in the pancreatic duct to get larger and higher and cause more damage, we will uh, intervene and within the first 24 hours go in and perform an ERCP and try to relieve that obstruction. Uh, if the patients have trauma to the pancreas and they're leaking pancreatic juice, we'll often put stents in the pancreatic duct to prevent that leakage from continuing. Um, in the really severe cases of pancreatitis, these patients are typically in the intensive care unit. They're monitored, they're given bowel rest, we'll give them enteral nutrition, or, and we'll follow them for a period of time until they recover. Uh, there used to be a lot of movement towards the operating room to try to, to perform surgery on these patients with uh, severe pancreatitis and necrosis. We now know that it's probably best not to do that and essentially manage these patients with conservative care, endoscopic therapies as they move, evolve through their course of pancreatitis. Chronic pancreatitis is a different disease. It's not the acute inflammation of the pancreas and infectious complications. It's more related to longstanding inflammation and fibrosis in the pancreas. These patients often get problems with loss of pancreatic function. They become diabetics. They can develop dilation of their pancreatic duct, which is one of the typical findings of, of this. Uh, and they'll also have issues with uh, stone formation in the pancreatic duct. This is a different type of stone. It's a calcified stone. It's very visible on radiographic images. They, uh, patients can also get acute on chronic pancreatitis. So they have developed chronic pancreatitis. They have stones in their pancreatic duct now, and then they block off the duct acutely and they get an acute exacerbation of pancreatitis. So there are interventions that we perform for these. All of these patients, if they have exocrine deficiency, we put them on pancreatic enzyme replacement. We have them orally taking pancreatic enzymes to help them digest their food. That seems to be effective and it helps them reduce their uh, pain. This is the typical uh, appearance of x-rays of chronic pancreatitis. There's often a fair amount of calcifications noted in the pancreas. So you'll see these calcified glands, you'll see these calcified rocks in the duct themselves, and you'll see a dilated pancreatic duct. The treatment is really medical therapy. There are two things that we think aggravate chronic pancreatitis. That would be alcohol and tobacco. So we try to stop both of those agents. We give them analgesics and pancreatic enzyme replacement. Chronic pancreatitics are at risk for developing pancreatic cancer, higher in, in incidence than other patients. Pancreatic cancer is also a very common spontaneous cancer in this country. It's an extremely deadly cancer. Um, and uh, it occurs often in, by the time we recognize that it's occurred because of biliary obstruction or other symptoms, the patients often have very advanced disease. There's some relationships to family history, smoking, alcohol, obesity, diabetes, and chronic pancreatitis. Uh, the symptoms that patients present with are typically painless jaundice. That's the classic symptom for pancreatic cancer. Weight loss, itching, poor appetite, abdominal pain, and nausea and vomiting. Uh, the diagnosis is almost always made by radiographic imaging with a double duct sign, and you'll see a blockage of both the bile duct and the pancreatic duct because there's some structure here in the head of the pancreas that's blocking those two pipes. We usually do endoscopic ultrasound now to make a tissue diagnosis. That's a fairly common procedure that allows us to get tissue from the mass and have it looked at by a cytologist. This just reveals the overall poor prognosis for this disease. Uh, with a one-year survival that's only 25%, even with modern chemotherapeutic agents, that may be prolonged a little bit, but it's still a problem. 
The treatment is typically on, uh, medical therapy with oncology to consolidate the disease and then surgery to resect it. And the surgery is the Whipple procedure that you may have heard of where we actually remove the head of the pancreas, readjust the, the uh, lumens to uh, drain the biliary tree in the gut. There's also different uh, operations for different locations of cancer. Biliary obstruction that occurs with pancreatic cancer is a problem, and we can usually treat that very easily now with our metallic stents. Uh, we tend to use metallic stents during chemotherapy because the patients tend to have less uh, complications with obstruction and cholangitis from the stents. And these are the typical uh, metallic stents that we use that work quite well for this condition. Um, pancreatic necrosis is a whole other topic. I'm not going to spend a lot of time discussing it. We mentioned it briefly. Uh, there are two diseases I want to mention quickly. Primary sclerosing cholangitis is an inflammatory disease of the biliary tree that occurs uh, often in conjunction with inflammatory bowel disease, so ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease. These patients get diffuse strictures in their biliary tree. We manage it often endoscopically, but many of these patients go on to get liver transplants because the disease can be difficult to manage. The other condition that PSC leads to is cholangiocarcinoma, where those inflammatory strictures become malignant. Because of that, they become uh, problematic and they have to be resected. If the patient's liver is strong enough or able to withstand a resection, it would be a primary operation to remove the cancer. Cancer. These are often detected at ERCP with brushings or biopsies, and they can be very challenging in terms of their management because often they're not resectable and the patients have to be stented long term. And that was the review of liver, gallbladder, and pancreas in 20 minutes or less, maybe. <laughs> Thank you.